Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to TGR, The Great Recommission, on uh, WTVO Radio. Um, if you're on, listening online, there's also a chat room. If you go to WTVORadio.com slash stations slash TGR dot M-I-S-S. Um, and you're welcome, if you have any questions, to post them in the box. We're working on and we're working towards getting a call in for this show, for certain episodes of this show. For those that don't know what they're listening to, we are three men in a Bible. My name is Jason Arnold. I'm an evangelist out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. With me on the line is, is Pastor Mark Fawner, a um, Wesleyan minister from um, Ohio, and also my brother and fellow evangelist, um, Barry Dodson. There's uh, two different beliefs out there. There's a belief system that a person uh, once saved will always be saved no matter what. And in some aspects, that is true. And then there's another aspect that says someone that is saved can also lose their salvation. And there's scriptures that both sides of the argument can quote. And we're going to probably end up going through, I'm sure we're going to end up going through some of those and maybe answering some of those questions and stuff and getting a perspective from all three of us. So, uh, Mark, good. what do you have? <laughs> well, I think the biggest thing that, that, that I have to start off, start this off with is um, that the idea of losing one salvation is nothing that, that, that is new. This, is, this has been, um, as we talked about before the show, this, this has kind of been out and about um, – in the Christian community for centuries, this is nothing that's new. But the but the ones who brought this forward in the modern Christian uh, era is is really a man by the name of John Wesley, the founder of uh, modern day Methodism. Um, and one of the things that uh, you know he came to the realization of this, it really. Uh, was not that big of a shock to him because one of the things he, he said when he was reading his scriptures was the fact that he saw this throughout the New Testament and some of the old. But one of the key things we have here is uh, goes back to what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 7. You know, he said he, he was talking to the disciples and, and some people uh, who were following them, and he says, "Not everyone who says to who says to me." Lord, Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the only the one who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. That's in Matthew 7, 15 to 23. You know, here we have the Son of God stating that those who walk around say doing all these great things and these marvelous works and casting out demons and doing all these things aren't real Christians. And to me, that's scary. I mean, that, that, that's something where uh, Paul wrote to work out our, our, our salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah, I agree. Um, what, and, now, now, one thing that before we get going too far into this, and we might have somebody, we might have some people that that don't really understand what we're talking about. They might have some new Christians online listening to this. And what I want to understand, what I want to go over first is what is salvation? Okay, and uh, salvation is deliverance from danger or suffering. To save is to deliver or protect. The word carries the idea of victory, health, and perseverance. Preservation, per, preservation. Sometimes in the Bible, uses the word "saved" or "salvation" to refer to temporal, physical deliverance, such as Paul's deliverance from prison. Philippians 1:19. More often, the word "salvation" concerns an eternal, spiritual deliverance. When Paul told the Philippian jailer what he must do to be saved, he was referring to the jailer's eternal destiny. That's Acts 16, 30-31. Jesus equated being saved with entering the kingdom of God, Matthew 19, 24-25. What, what are we saved from? In the Corinthians, 
in the Christian doctrine of salvation, we are saved from wrath, that is, from God's judgment of sin. Romans 5, 9, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, 5, 9. Our sin has separated us from God, and the consequences of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. Biblical salvation refers to our deliverance from the consequence of sin and therefore involves the removal of sin. Who does the saving? Only God can remove sin and deliver us from sin's penalty. 2 Timothy 1, 9 and Titus 3, 5. How does God save? In the Corinth, in the I don't know why I'm on Corinthians today. In the in the Christian doctrine of salvation, God has rescued us through Christ. John three seventeen. Specifically, it was Jesus' death on the cross and subsequent resurrection that achieved our salvation. Romans five ten, Ephesians one seven. Scripture is clear that salvation is the gracious, undeserved gift of God. Ephesians two five and eight, and is only available through faith in Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12. How do we receive salvation? We are saved by faith. First, we must hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus, death and resurrection. Ephesians 1.13. Then we must believe, fully trust the Lord Jesus. Romans 1.16. This involves repentance, a changing of mind about sin in Christ. Acts 3.19. And calling on the name of the Lord. Romans 10.9-10. Uh, through 10, and 13. A definition of the Christian doctrine of salvation would be the deliverance by the grace of God from eternal punishment for sin, which is granted to those who accept by faith God's conditions of repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. Salvation is available in Jesus alone, John 4.16, Acts 4.12, and is dependent on God alone for provision, assurance, and security. So hopefully that'll give you some background on what uh, what we're talking about here as far as salvation is concerned. Right. And I, I think um, there's a lot of division over this topic, and I have friends on both sides of the issue. I have Arminian friends that, you know, are just full-blown Arminian, and, and, and I have friends that are five-point Calvinists, and they are just just as much a Christian as, as the Arminians. And I think the, the confusion comes in on is a lot of people see, oh, people believe once saved, always saved. They believe you can do whatever you want. You can, once you say, once you get saved, you can do what you want. And no matter what you do, you go into heaven. And the people that I know that believe in the doctrine of once saved, always saved, do not believe that at all. They believe that if we're, you know, say if we're once saved, always saved. If we fall away, then we never were saved to begin with. You know, and not I'm not talking about slip away for a few days or, or fall from God for, a, you know, a, make a mistake a night or whatever. But fall away in a major way, like for years or for weeks or, you know, months or whatever, then, you know, their view, the viewpoint is they never were saved to begin with. The people that do hold to once saved, always saved. So it's not... It's not like a lot, what a lot of people perceive it as. It's not like what a lot of people think of it as and look at look at it as. And I've seen it attacked a lot from that perspective. And it, it's just not the proper proper way to de debate the doctrine. Um, and I've, I've you know me and Mark have talked about this a lot. And I think whenever you know salvation belongs to the Lord, no doubt. It's Psalm three eight. So salvation belongs to the Lord. It's Revelation 7.10, and crying with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Jonah 2.9, but I, with the voice of things given, was sacrificed to you that I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jeremiah 2.23, how can you say I'm not unclean? I have not gone after balls. Look at your way in the valley. Now what you have done, a restless camera running here and there. Psalm 37, 39. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is the stronghold. So God owns salvation. And what I what I have a problem with is, is man pronouncing man saved and man determining what man saved, man determining who the elect is, man determining who's not elect. And you know that that's where there's a there's a big yeah. issue and divide. Um yeah. Yeah, that, and that's huge there, Jason. And on the opposite side of that as well, is that 
those of us from the Wesleyan Armenian standpoint don't believe you're just walking down the street. Uh, you have a you have a bad thought, and instantly you're lost. That's not that's not what we believe either. There's got to be a deliberate thought. There's got to be a deliberate decision to walk away from God. Uh, there's got to be a deliberate decision to involve yourself in such a sin as to separate yourself from God, knowingly doing that. And, um, you know, I can tell you that that, you know, uh, that sort of decision uh, is one that comes with a great deal of consequence. Um, and those type of those type of decisions aren't made. Uh, well, I think at times they're, they're made too lightly, and yet those decisions have eternal consequences. Um, you know, we we talk a great deal about that, and like you said, you and I have talked about that quite a lot, and all that. But you know, Paul wrote, you know, in Hebrews six, you know, it's impossible. Uh, 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 which is li li literally the Greek. Uh, there's actually five words in Greek for impossible, uh, literally meaning in, uh, it's one of the few that actually mean impossible to do something. Uh, in that case, for those who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying Christ again, the Son of God, their own harm, and holding him up to contempt. You know, and th this, is, th this is one of the things that Wesley pointed to a, uh, does it mean that, uh, this means it's somebody that is so hardened, that their heart is so hardened that there is no, for them being restored, Short, short of God's mercy and grace touching them in such a way that they that they see themselves as this hardened hearted person heading towards hell and I, and I, I think there are many many people out there today that um, that fit that bill yes could you could you maybe use uh, as an analogy Pharaoh in that kind of in, in, in one sense that you know, the scripture says, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I don't think God literally went down and hardened Pharaoh's heart. I think I think Pharaoh's pride, thinking that he was a God, is and the jealousy he might have had towards the Jew, Jewish God is what really hardened Pharaoh's heart. Oh, and I think so. And why he could never probably have come to salvation. I, I, I think so. Uh, you know, keep in mind, you know, we have to look at the Egyptian culture, and you're absolutely right. Pharaoh considered that the pharaohs considered themselves literally God on earth. Um, now, when they came to that, I have no idea, but, uh, you know, when, you know, they became pharaoh, they were literally, they, they were literally God on the planet. And I, I believe you're absolutely right. That was, you know, pride. Pride has a really bad, really bad uh, way of uh, uh, messing you up. Yeah. And I think we see that there. Exactly. Look what it did to Satan. <laughs> uh, That's the perfect example exactly. of pride. Um, from from the um, I've noticed that what, as doing an evangel as being an evangelist, street minister, walking the street, that without I, I could talk to people and. Talk to this person, talk to that person, and you can, you can tell when the Holy Spirit has genuinely softened someone's heart to receive the gospel. And does from from the Wesleyan point of view, do you see it as uh, the Holy Spirit working on both ends, or is it mainly just a decision to to follow Christ by the person from the person? No, no, the the, the Holy Spirit works works in, in all people. Uh, and, and that's that's probably something that again is one of those misnomers that's out there, um, those misunderstandings, if you will. But the Holy Spirit works in the lives of all people, bringing them to a uh, to a decision, if if you will, a crisis point to make a decision for Christ. Uh, and we believe that that is something that happens to all people. 
Um, so that's just, uh, you know, that's something that, and that's a very good point because I think that's, uh, there, there's a misunderstanding that there, it's kind of one-sided. Um, it, it almost borders on, um, boy, this opens up another topic, uh, that almost borders on uh, uh, the thing of predestination and the elect. Right. I don't. I, I don't want to get into that tonight. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. We need to stick to the topic once they though. See, that is um, that, that is borderline. Um, so how? I mean, how can we even know that if someone is is once they're saved, they're always saved? How can we even know if if somebody's going to lose their salvation? I mean, if salvation belongs to the Lord, then only He knows. It would seem only He knows if that person is going to fall away from Christ. Only he knows if that person was ever saved to begin with. So, we, I mean, it seems like we have all this division, division and arguing over something we don't even truly know. Well, let me, ask, let, me, let me ask this, okay, or say this. We as Christians, once we become Christian and we start studying and we start becoming, I guess, disciples of Christ, because we're studying his word, learning who he is, learning what the oracles and commandments and everything of the kingdom are. What, you know, trying to learn the heart of God, which is a lot to a lot to say, but that's what we're doing basically. Okay, okay, and and, it, and and scripture tells us that we can do that. Okay, that because in John 17, you know, Jesus tells us that he wishes us all to be one like him and his father. Okay, so my question is, or not really a question, but a statement would be, mature Christians should be able, in some fashion or another, be able to know whether or not somebody is saved or not. Okay, because of all the studying and the process that we went through for our salvation. Okay, I mean, we have it written in the scriptures of, of who won't make it to heaven. So if you see somebody involved in this kind of lifestyle, you got to know right then and there, well, they ain't not going to make it into heaven. You know, we got to get the word to them somehow and at least give them a chance to, to repent of that. Right. What do, you, what do you think? I mean, we have that obligation, but we still, we have no idea. We don't, we don't know, you know, if they're saved or they're not saved. We don't know if one day they're on their deathbed, one day. You know, thirty or thirty days before they die, they might end up finally their heart well, no, might be softened by the Holy Spirit. I'm, but well, we, we still have that, that obligation. But I'm, but I'm saying at that point in time that we see this going on. You know, we we can tell that just by their actions that they're probably not saved because right. we know what the Scripture tells us who the, who were saved. I mean, what you know, uh, and like Paul told the Corinthians, you know, neither drunkard, you know. Uh, reveler or anybody like that that's causing, that's going through that kind of lifestyle over and over again. You know, and I think I think Christians are, are, are becoming so I don't know if it's, I can't say dumbed down but so weak to stand up and say, hey, this is wrong, okay? We shouldn't be doing this. Scripture, we have it clear in Scripture that mm -hmm. this is wrong, this is not the lifestyle that a member of the kingdom of God is should be living, and you're in jeopardy of either losing your salvation or not being saved at all. Right. I mean, so. Well, I, 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 and, and I think there, there, there's a real good analogy that Jason hit on, is that the analogy of us declaring um, that someone, you know, they come down an altar, they say a prayer, they get up, we declare them saved, and they, and we do nothing else with them. Right. That scripturally is absolutely incorrect. It makes me absolutely my 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 gut wrenches when we have somebody who comes down to an altar, prays a prayer, they get up, we declare them saved, we walk out the door and do nothing else for them. Have we yeah. shown them how to read the Bible? Have we showed them get them involved in a Bible study? Have we shown them how to walk in the Spirit? Have we shown them how to find out what their spiritual gifts are? Have we got them involved in things? And not just to get them involved, but to get them involved in the body of Christ. Yeah. And, and you know, 
we, it, it is not just a prayer that saves you. No. And that is where in the American church today, we have lost the sense of, well, just say this prayer, or do this, and you're saved. That is That will lead more people to hell than, you know, and I know I posted against that a few times, but just, just bear with me here. That, that will lead more people to hell, I think, than any other thing that we do. Because we've got to have the infrastructure in place in the churches today to deal with the people who are born again. And I can give you story after story after story of people who have come in, we've, they've come down, made some sort of decision, they've walked out, and they haven't come back to a, to a church since. Yeah, and that's uh, – and I don't know, I guess – I guess, you know, part of that we can take the blame for not, you know, uh, uh, you know, going further with them in their in their spiritual walk. And but then again, those that do go further in their spiritual walk, you know, you'll always hear me preach this yeah. or, or preach this it's one scripture. And it says it says show, the scripture says show fruits worthy of repentance. Yep. OK. And we're not. And, and don't get me wrong. We don't do works to earn our salvation. Okay? Absolutely. Our salvation is a free gift. Automatic just given to us. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right? Just saying, here, I, I, I put myself on this cross hoping that you would come to me. Is what basically Jesus did. Oh, yeah. You know? and, and so, we don't, it's not that we're proving our, our, our Christianity to the world. It's that we've been born again. We've re we've become a new person. We've we've taken on a new identity, and we we're thinking a different way. And we maybe at first we start to act like a Christian, okay? But that's a good thing because eventually it should become a lifestyle, the way we live our lives. And that's what G and that's what God told the Israelites when He was moving them from different countries, not to. Not to look like these certain people, because he wanted them to stand out and live a certain way, be a certain type of person. True. True. And uh, I get and, and, and I've got some, and, and I kind of lean towards that you can lose your salvation. Okay, I lean more towards that than one being saved at all times. And I've got some questions uh, that was asked, and I'll let. Y'all try to answer these, and then I'll I'll go over them and stuff. But one of the uh, scriptures that comes up on the on the side of always saved is uh, in John ten twenty eight says, "I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand." That's John ten. So, what are y'all's thoughts on that? Let me pull that up here. Um. Yep. I mean, mine are God knows who's going to fall away. God knows who is his children. God knows. God is all knowing, all seeing. You know, God, there's, there's no denying that. Um, God is omniscient. You know, Psalm 139, 1 through 5. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and rising up. You understand my thought far off. Uh, Psalm 145. 7, 4, he counts the numbers of stars, he calls them by name. Psalm 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. Jeremiah 16, 17, my, my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face. Matthew 10, 30, but he counts the very hairs on our head are numbered. So God, no matter what, knows whenever you were born, whether you, whenever you die, you are going to benefit from the atonement. He knows. I mean, if to say he doesn't know is to say he's not all knowing, right? Am I am I wrong here, Mark? I don't think you're wrong there. Um, uh, my only thing on that on, on that specific verse would be that in a, I just checked, checked it in the Greek that uh, and it's a, it's a really good translation there. But the only thing I would say there would be that. Yes, no one can snatch you out of their hands. And who who is the uh, I gave them to eternal life that they that no one will snatch them out. Who is the them? That would yeah. be Satan. 
Okay? Uh, but does that mean that we cannot walk away from that hand? That would be the only question I, I, I would throw out to that. You know, if you're, if you're in God's hand, does that mean you couldn't say, Lord, sorry, not going to do this anymore, and, and walk away? Do you, not. I mean, you could, but God, but God knows if you would or not, so... Oh yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, he he knows, and there's he those that before the world who he knew were going to receive salvation. Nobody was going to snatch them from from his hand. I mean, there may be times in their life where they they rebel against God. Because my, I mean, my salvation story is a lot different than most people. I was raised Roman Catholic. I don't believe I was ever saved as a child. 15 years old, end up getting put in a full gospel school. Everybody's talking in tongues. I'm Catholic boy. I'm listening to Garth Brooks in, church, um, in my truck. I have a Miami Hurricane starter jacket on. I'm, I'm being told I'm going to hell for having a Miami Hurricane starter jacket and listening to Garth Brooks. So I'm like, oh, man. man, I don't, you know, I don't want none of this. You know, I don't want none of this religion. And then I go to Catholic, and it's just like kneel down, sit up, kneel down, sit up, and it's just. I'm getting nothing out of there, and then eventually I go to this church with my friend, and I pray a sinner's prayer one time, and a week later I'm, I'm smoking weed and doing drugs. And, and, you know, was I saved at the time I prayed the sinner's prayer? No. But then when I was 29, you know, years, ah. years and years later, 14 years, God used my youngest son, um, who was very sick, born with transposition of the ah. eight arteries, to, to draw me to him and and through that situation and radically saved my whole family and brother you need to write a book about that <laughs> and I did if it, for those who haven't read it read the story it's online awesomemiracles.com slash or just go to awesomemiracles.com and click on Jaden's story but with with my salvation experience I have no doubt that that God chose us why I don't know. Do we deserve it? Absolutely not. But I have no doubt. I don't know if that, that works the same way for everybody. You know, I read some scriptures. Some scriptures point to, yes, it does. Some scriptures point to, no, it doesn't. But I, in my salvation experience, I know that God kind of chose us. And God, even whenever I was rebelling against him, he knew one day I was going to eventually, you know, come to him and serve him. And for the past going on nine years you know i've served christ and, and grown closer to christ and even became a minister a prison minister and evangelist and on the radio and been even have my own ministry now which street ministry and which we go into bad neighborhoods and hand out bibles and you know if i would have told you that I, for 14 years i argued against god's existence i argued against everything i was agnostic atheist if Somebody would have told me, hey, one day you're going to be preaching the gospel. I would have told them, you, you know, you're absolutely nuts. But God in his, in his all-knowing, you know, omniscience, which is something we can, we can never grasp and never understand. And that's one thing about these doctrines. You know, people divide over them and fight over them. And, you know, we don't understand them because they, there's a part of them, no matter if it's the Wesleyan part or it's the... The Calvinist part that are that are based on the natures of God, and we can never truly understand or grasp the natures of God. You know, it's just God's omniscience is something we can't fully grasp or understand, no matter how hard we try. God's omnipresence, where He's everywhere, is something that we can't grasp or understand, no matter how hard we try but it but it, it's what the bible says and we serve this god that's so powerful but and we can argue all day about if he predestined this person or chose this person or but he knows you know and i think a lot of things with this once saved always saved th this is kind of my perspective on it if you look at it from god's perspective and say once saved always saved it's true because in God's eyes, God knows once you're truly saved. And God knows you're not going to fall away from him and you're going to stay serving him. 
And God knows the day you die, you're going to be serving him. And God knows you'll, you'll endure to the end. God knows you'll work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, if you look at it from the person, personal perspective, it's false. Because you don't know if you're going to, to fall away from Christ one day. You don't know if you're going to give in to those temptations. You don't know if you're going to, be able to fight this off or fight that off. You hope and you might have faith in Christ that that will endure all that. But without a 100% beyond the whole reasonable doubt, only God knows if you endure to the end. And uh, that's that's kind of the way I look at, look at it from both sides. From God's perspective, it's true. From man's perspective, it's it's kind of it's false. And, my, and one thing that, that that and this is only my flesh speaking, probably, and 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 just me thinking about this. But you know, and I, and I'm not denying that God is all knowing. He's got to know. It. I mean, He created everything. <laughs> I mean, so He's got to know how it's going to react, how it's going to be, and stuff. But can you imagine the torture? That he has to endure in knowing who's going to be coming to him and who's not. That's my question that I question myself on. Does he want to know? You know what I'm saying? Because right. now he's got to sit there yeah. and, and, and know who's coming to him and who's not. And know that, hey, man, look at this person who I've created. And I, cannot, I mean, I think about that with my own daughter and say, you know, and sit there and say, Man, I know whether or not she she's saved or not, and whether or not she and, and to see your children running around on the earth and knowing that man, you know, I, I'm just never gonna have a relationship with them. That's gotta be that, that's that's gotta be tough. Maybe but he, that's why God Himself, the Father, cannot look down on us. That we have to go through Jesus Christ. Mark, um, yeah. I have a guy in the chat room that that made a great point. If you're a child of God. Can you stop being a child of God? Of course not. How would, you, as a Wesleyan Armenian, how would you respond to that? If you're a child of God, are you always a child of God? I can. Let, let me just answer that um, from my own life life experience. Um, there was a time in my life where I was a Christian. I was a pastor. Um, had a business, had a great job, had a wife, family, all that. Um, made some, it wasn't all my decisions, but there's a series of bad things and, uh, you know, walked away from God myself. Um, I thought that if there was, uh, and this is a very painful time in my life, um, I don't, don't want to get into the details of it, but there was a very painful time in my life. And I can tell you this, I know from an absolute fact that if the Lord had returned, and this is the thing that finally got me back to where I needed to be, I wasn't reading my Bible, I was doing things I shouldn't be doing, I knew that if God came back, I was not going. I knew that in my spirit, I knew that in my heart, I knew that in my head. Mm -hmm. I knew that. So I know from a fact that, um, you know, that this, that you can walk away from the Lord. I've done it. It is not fun. Uh, Jesus said in John 15, 16, I'm the true vine. My father is a husband, uh, husbandman. Every branch in me beareth not, beareth not fruit. He taketh away. I'm the vine. You are the branches. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. You can be in the vine, but if you're not bearing fruit, that's it. You know, in that bearing of fruit is the fruits that it's not works. And that's the thing we've got to get through through the people. Right. It's not works. It is bearing the fruits of the Spirit. Love, patience, charity. All those things combine that defines us who we are in Christ. And if we're not doing those things, and I was not doing those things, I knew I, I knew that I was saved before that. I knew I was not saved during that time. So I know from a personal aspect of that, 
uh, that, uh, you know, when it talks about, uh, and just finish the verse, he said, uh, it's cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. Now, if you look at that, and, and this is something that Wesley quoted, you know, the, the person spoken here are, the, are Christ's branches in the true vine, and some of these branches abide not in Christ, but, are, but the Father takes them away. And the branches which abide are not cast forth out of Christ in his church. They are not only cast forth, but withered. Consequently, they're never grafted in again. They are burned. Mark, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, man. Okay. Uh, one thing, one of the objections that I have right here, not not to you, but just that I have on paper, I is that it, it says... Uh, those who truly get saved will faithfully endure to the end and never f and, and never follow another. This is and here was the answer to this. They said they asked about this. What about King Saul? What about Solomon? And what about Ju Judas Iscariot? Judas, I don't think was ever a believer. Uh, Ju Judas, uh, there was several different sects of Judaism at the time, and Judas. Seems to be uh, seemed to have been looking for uh, like the zealot. Uh, you know, he was looking for a military messiah, one that would come and rescue Israel out of uh, the yeah. hands of the Romans. Yeah, I think yeah, so let's too. Just that's, that's let's just cancel him out. Let's yeah. just, what about? Okay. But look, we got King Saul and Solomon. I mean, these are two of, of what giants. He, yeah, giants that were in the kingdom of God at one time. Well, look at then, Saul. And, and and the witch. Yeah, he turned I mean, and went to a witch. I mean, you can't, you cannot be a child of God to do that. I mean, that that is just something that is, um, you know, it, it, it's an anathema. It's 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 totally against Scripture, and yet we we, we find that that he did it. Solomon, all his, I, I mean, that's the thing that kills me about Solomon. All of his wisdom, yeah. and he, he yeah. ends up falling on his own sword. I mean, you know, he he, he didn't get it. He he, he he lost it. He had it. He had it. Yep, somewhere along the line. Okay, let's go to, uh, what about John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his one, his, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, a lot of people use this as, okay, well, see, right then and there, right there. Just as, we, as long as we believe in Jesus, we'll never lose our life. And then John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see a life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So everybody who does not believe has the wrath of God abiding on them. So, um, I mean, it's it's... The invita—I mean, I don't think the invitation is closed to anyone. If if you end up in hell, it's not because God sent you there. And I don't even think even the most even the five point Calvinists who are who are my friends do not believe that God sent you to hell. You know, if if I if I end up in hell at the end of this life, it is because of Jason Arnold. If I, if Barry ends up in hell at the end of this life, it's because of Barry Dodson. It's not because of God. It's not because of God's choices. It's not because God chose a sinner or whatever else. God searched your heart without a doubt, and God saw you. Here's um one thing that the people in the chat room are bringing up some great points. Um, Lynn said she, she, you know, she walked away from God. Several people walked away from God, and you know, but now they're they're back with Christ. Um. Yeah. And Lim said she, she she walked away from God for over 20 years and came back. Mark, you yeah. walked away from God for for a period of time and and came back. You know, I've been a Christian. I, I, yeah, I've been a Christian for for nine years and have not walked away. Barry, how long have you been a Christian? Have, I, uh, we'll say probably 12 years. And you never walked away? Not no, not in the last 12 years. No, oh, no. Oh. I mean, I I I would consider. And this is going to sound funny to people. I would consider myself a Christian my whole life, meaning that my father, when he was alive, pushed, pushed Jesus on me. Not pushed, but 
talked about Jesus. There was never a Bible. We never went to church in the house. Okay, mm -hmm. I always fought about going to church. I didn't. I went and hid because I didn't want to go to church on Sundays. Okay, but my father always uh, talked about Jesus and talked about God and. He would just, he never, we never were a denomination. He would just visit whatever church. He figured whatever church it was, that was, you know, if they were a church and they and they believed in God, then that was a good church to go to, okay? So God always kept himself around me. God, then eventually we had Bibles in the, in, in the, in the house. Well, I got, I guess around 12 or 13, I got fascinated with the book of Revelations, you know, uh, you know, lions, tigers, and bears, you know, basically. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, I just got fascinated with it for some reason and just, you know, just always would pick it up and would read God's Word. And I got – I would read the prophecies, but I never really understood them. But then I would read other scriptures and then – but I never lived the life of a Christian. I never lived like, uh, you know, like, like a member of the kingdom, you know, because I wouldn't say, all right? But God always kept himself there. And then I guess it was one day, just all of a sudden, you know, I was one of those barroom preachers that would go into the barroom, get wasted, and then start talking about God. You know, and I knew everything there was about God, you know, and which I really didn't at the time. But I thought I did, and I preached it. I talked to people about You know how you get on those subjects when you get if, – yeah. if, 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 if you're a drinker, if you've ever drank and gotten drunk and stuff like that, you know the conversations you get into when you're drinking. Right. Anyway, so uh, so uh, and and that's what I did. And then all of a sudden, one day it was one day, one night, and it's it, it, it's like I, 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 all of a sudden I started understanding Revelation. I started seeing it in the real world. I started seeing it actually the prophecies you could actually see happening in life. You know what I'm saying? And I thought, and I started, they started coming to me, and I started listening to this guy, and he started making it wasn't some far fetch, you know, aliens coming down and opening up a big pit. It was actual life experiences that were that you could actually were tangible, you know. It was actually a flood, you know. It was actually a real water and a real boat that Noah was in. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't some just mystical thing that you just kind of had a foggy idea about. So, uh, so, uh, so once God said, "Okay, look, you know, I, I, it's now or never. You've got to make a choice." You know, and I heard that so clear. Just it's now or never. You've got to make that choice. What's it going to be? And ever since then, I, I've been. It's it's been. I've been on. So no, no, I've been on board the whole. You know, the last 12 years. Uh, we have an excellent point from a guy in the chat room named Ronald. Thank you, Ronald, for, for posting it. He, he says in Hebrews, it says, I want to get your perspective on this, Mark. And in Hebrews, it says that it is impossible to renew one to repentance if one is saved and forfeits that salvation. It is impossible to be saved again. And I asked it for the scripture, and it's Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. For it, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the word world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, saying they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So... Yeah, that's the one that that, that, that verse I, quote, I quoted earlier on in, in the program. Um, one of the things that that we and again we have to be uh, we have to understand where what the word impossible here means um, is l literally in, in this in this case it is uh, the, the word adonotos, which is literally um, cannot be done in Greek. It is. Um, it's a word that is uh, only used, I think, about maybe six or seven times in the New Testament. But bottom line is that this sort of uh, oh, scripture is dealing with those people whose heart is so hardened, whose heart is so turned away from the things of God that it is literally impossible for them to see the things of God, to, to, to Barry's analogy, for those people who are, you know, 
who, who know all you know the, who, who know all the scriptures you know when, when they're a little tipsy right. uh, that that type of thing these people are exact opposite they don't want to have a thing to do with God they don't want to have a thing to do with the church they don't want a thing to do with Christian people that is where this 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 is is geared toward those people who will not ever confess Jesus Christ those are the ones who walk away who want who really there's a great analogy here to be made with, with the one with that phrase that you used are, were these people actually saved in the first place that is where I think this fits yeah and, and let me expound on that a little bit too Go ahead, uh, see if this helps uh, to ask if one can be born again and again is a rhetorical question that has confused some to be born again is the same as getting saved or believing in Jesus that's John 3 3. John 3, 3 through 18. But if one would stop believing in Jesus, then later start believing again, he would indeed be saved again. Romans 11, 23 declares. Remember also the prodigal who, the prodigal, exactly where I was going. prodigal who became alive again after he repented. Luke 15, 24 and 32. Also, Romans 11, 19 to 23 says this. You will say then, branches were broken off, and I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell. Severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. So, okay. I hope that helps. I have, I have an interesting question. In, in God's omniscience, is salvation ever lost for the elect? What do you mean? Like in his all knowingness, like in, in his in his view of self, is does he see does he ever look at did he ever look at the if the prodigal son's assuming he finished his life and ended up in heaven? Um you know, knowing King David ended up in heaven, knowing Paul the Apostle ended up in heaven, whenever they were they're not serving Christ, in his omniscience, did did God ever see them as not benefiting from the atonement, as not being, you know, as not being saved, as not being the elect, as not being his sheep. Just like just saying that, well, this guy's not going to ever follow me, but yet this guy will. Right. Something like that. So, yeah. yeah. Is, is it is in God's omniscience, in God's all noise, is salvation ever lost? For the elect, for those who are elect, well, for those who would definitely receive salvation. But who are the? But then now you got to get into who are the elect. The elect exactly. Well, assuming the elect is whoever receives salvation, assuming if you, if if Barry at the end of this life, you know, ends up going to heaven and being with Christ and is one of Christ's sheep, and he receives eternal life in God's omniscience, were you ever not saved? Were you ever not? You know, one of his children? Were you well, ever not one of his sheep? Like, well, go, doesn't that go, go to the scripture uh, that the sin is cast as far as east is from the west? That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah I mean, and this will blow your mind. I know we're running, running a little short here, but, uh, you know, there's a school of thought in, in the uh, seminaries now that God actually limits himself to who is saved and who is not saved. Now, this is something fairly new. It's not really new, probably in the last 40 years, but um, it's actually making its way through the seminaries, and um, um, I speak out about it quite frequently when it pops its up its ugly little head. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I mean, th this junk is out there right now, but I just wanted to throw that point out there. But... <laughs> Speaking of junk, speaking of what exactly now? What? 
Uh, basically, what what it, it says, what the what the theory says, is that God limits Himself to knowing who is saved and who is going to be saved and who is not going to be saved. God limits Himself. Yep. That's like the he uh, like what like what? he like he just turns his his eye like turns a blind eye. Yep. And what what scriptural basis do they use to to make this point? Oh, there is none. <laughs> that, makes, that, 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 that makes any sense, at least. They, they, they right. try to justify it with with one obscure verse out of, uh, I think it's Zechariah, hmm. and one out of Jeremiah, and it makes absolutely no sense. I mean, none. Um, and but this is, I, I mean, we could get off on a tangent on this, but I'm just, uh, you know. Just, just throwing that out that there, there is that thought out there right now. Uh, hey, go. I'll uh, throw this out at you. What about the Corinthian guy that was having an affair with his uh, stepmother? Is basically what people believe it was. Okay, mm -hmm. he was having an affair with his father's wife. <laughs> okay, okay. Mm. What? Okay, and. It's hard. I, I don't know if we can use him because do we really know if he was saved? No, if there's if there's no I, no evidence yeah. of him being saved, I, it's not a yeah. good point. I mean, I was in debates a couple of weeks ago with somebody on Facebook that was just insisted his whole argument against once saved always saved was that Judas was saved and he lost his salvation. But the thing is, the Bible does not say Judas was saved, so you can't you know if you can't ground your argument in Scripture, just you know, you just can't do it. And, you know, I've, I've ran into things like that where, okay, well, this makes sense, but can I back it up with Scripture 100%? No. So it, you know, falls flat. So, I well, mean... Okay, I just I just found this. Let me read this. Okay. Let me read this. Okay. All right. Uh, it says, uh, Paul believed one could be sexually immoral and saved at the same time, according to 1 Corinthians 5. The man who hmm. had his father's wife, a terrible skin, <laughs> a terrible sin, didn't lose his salvation. Thereby, in spite of the sin of fornication, Paul regarded the person as a saved man. Some have regarded 1 Corinthians 5.5 5 as the strongest verse in the Bible for one saved, always saved. So let's, let's, let's can somebody pull that up first? First Corinthians 5.5? Five, five. Yeah, First Corinthians 5.5? Five, five. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it now. Can you uh, go ahead, read it out. All right, uh, you have to actually start in 4. It says, When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, verse 5 is, You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that your spirit may be saved in the last day of the Lord. Okay. Um, I don't see any grounds for the for the argument. Mm. Um, we we only have one more no. minute, and then we're close. I, I want to yeah, we're close to an hour. There's so much to talk about, and <laughs> I will we'll continue this conversation. Won't save always save part two next week yeah. same time. Um, here's here's well, one thing. Be next week. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we will definitely revisit. Part two is coming. I don't know when, but but soon. But here's the thing: what Barry said about the sexual immoral person. If but I mean, this clear throughout the Bible, First Corinthians six nine and ten. Or do you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards. Nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. If you are any of these things, you're not saved. And if you practice in any of these things, you need to you need to repent. There's right, but, uh, don't, but but and, and I'm gonna speak for Jason when ahead. I say this. Okay, is that Jason is saying that if you are practicing this, if this is being, if you are 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 conniving to do these things, then you are probably you are you are not saved. But but you can fall into temptation as a Christian, yes. and 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 still be saved. You you still you know you because as a Christian you will eventually see your error, 
repent and come back to Christ. Amen. Yes. That's the key. No problem with that. Repent and see Christ, please. Everybody who's listening, draw near to him. He will draw near to you. Um, seek him. Repent of the, any sin that's in your life, any open sin. I'm going to um, close this out in prayer and call it a night. Lord God, we yeah. just thank you for this, this fellowship of brothers, Lord. We thank you for everybody who was able to tune in on the radio, Lord, and everybody that was able to tune in in the chat room, Lord. We thank you for the, the contributions made as, as we had a... A godly discussion, a biblical discussion without argument, without strife, Lord, but just seeking truth and seeking your word and seeking your Holy Spirit to guide us through the chapters of the Bible, Lord God. And we just pray that every person that hears this message and every person that opens opens your book, Lord God, the Bible, that just use, we just pray your spirit to send upon them, Lord, and help them read, help them understand and open their eyes in ways where they, they couldn't understand things before whenever they were in the flesh, Lord. We just pray that you save and, and, and every single person out there, Lord God, you be with them, you comfort them, you strengthen them as they go through difficult times in their lives and trials and tribulations. Lord God, you use those to, to strengthen them, Lord, and make them overcomers and let, let them one day be able to use the te those testimonies to glorify you, Lord God, on this earth and draw others closer to you, Lord. No matter if we're Calvinists, Arminian, or if we believe this way or that way, Lord, we can all come together for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is for your glory. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you, Mark. Amen. I thank you, Barry. And um, yeah, yeah. anything y'all want to close out with? Nope, I'm good. All right. Nope, well, we're good. Everybody have a great night, and I will see y'all next week, same time, same place. 7 p.m. on WTVO Radio. Thank you for tuning in. Good night.